Hello, everybody. This is Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Welcome to this Wednesday night Bible study for the Church of the Eternally Secure. I want to first uh, welcome any uh, newcomers. If you uh, were told about uh, this program and you're checking it out, uh, welcome. Maybe you just stumbled across it now. Maybe you'll watch the upload later or something. I just want to make sure I take an opportunity to welcome you here. I hope that uh, this study uh, is uh, beneficial to you. And, and uh, if so, maybe you'll want to join us every Wednesday night. Uh, we usually do them at 9.30 p.m. Eastern time. We're starting a little earlier tonight because uh, Sister Renee is uh, out of town on vacation, so we don't have to accommodate the later start time for her tonight. So we decided to start a little bit earlier. Uh, now, to the regular participants uh, in the chat room in our congregation, uh, welcome back. And uh, especially if you're a, a moderator, uh, I really need your help because uh, the, the trolls, uh, they, they persist. Uh, I understand last Sunday, a couple of people mentioned to me there was a troll, but they, they nipped it in the bud. So thank you for uh, handling that. The chat room is there for fellowship. It's not there for trolls to distract us, uh, challenging our core beliefs and taking us off onto subjects that we're not really uh, want to discuss at tonight. Tonight, there's a particular subject, and I'm, I'm asking everybody, stay on the same subject we're on. It's uh, Romans chapter 12, beginning with verse 9. Okay, so enough said about that. Uh, let me ask uh, Brother Cripps, say hi, introduce yourself. Maybe someone doesn't know uh, your, about your channel. Hi, <clears throat> excuse me. Hi, I'm Jason Cripps, and I'm part of a channel called True Story Live, which com comes on Sunday evenings, Eastern Standard Time at 9 p.m. And uh, the channel we have, uh, basically, we uh, bring, we try to get everyone to come to the table, regardless of their beliefs, and uh, talk about uh, everyday stuff with each other with respect and dignity and without backbiting. And um, we're able to state our positions without. Um, uh, being dogmatic and clinging to things, uh, but th what uh, definitely we uh, the spirit of the gospel is in, involved, and we uh, just just try and have conversations, open, authentic conversations. Um, so if you haven't listened to it, uh, definitely come over and, and check us out. But as far as tonight is concerned, we're on Sin City Preachers uh, weekly Bible study. So if it's your first time, welcome, and hello to everyone in the chat. It's exciting to see everyone. Thanks. Uh, all right, let me let me give context before we get started. Um, the Wednesday night Bible study, uh, I think we've been doing it for maybe six months now. And when we started these uh, Wednesday night Bible studies, we were doing a kind of a topical study. We, we selected famous sermons from the past and read through the sermons and discussed them. The first one was uh, The Warrant of Faith by... Uh, uh, Charles Haddon Spurgeon, and uh, I hope you'll go back and watch that. Uh, it, it, to me, it's the, the greatest sermon I've ever heard. Uh, Renee also agreed it. It was uh, an A-plus sermon for the real gospel, the, the free gift and the guarantee. Uh, and then we, we uh, did a couple of other sermons. One was by uh, uh, Jonathan Edwards, a famous sermon, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. And I hope you watch that. The contrast is, is dramatic between what he says and what Spurgeon says. Uh, we gave uh, Jonathan Edwards an F minus for his. And then we did another one, another bad one. This one was by Paul Washer, uh, the, the sermon that made so many people angry uh, in, in their uh, across America. Uh, so those, that's how we started off. After we did those sermons, though, we decided to go in a little different direction, and we, we agreed that we would work our way through the Pauline epistles, uh, beginning, of course, with Romans. And uh, when we started studying Romans, uh, we did an introductory video. And then the first couple of chapters were also, I would part, say, kind of foundational. And so I hope that if you're just joining us now and you don't have the whole context of the entire study on Romans, that you will eventually... Go back and watch it all from the beginning and get the context. Because I believe the book of Romans 
is one of the favorite books of the Bible. When you ask people, what are your favorite books? Romans is mentioned a lot. But uh, even though I love Romans, there's so much great stuff in Romans. There are a few chapters that are great pitfalls that, uh, that can really lead people in the wrong direction if they don't get the right context. Uh, so uh, please go back and watch the whole study from the beginning. But tonight, uh, we're going to pick it up where we left off last time, uh, chapter 12, beginning with verse 9. And I'm a KJV firstist, so I will read it in the KJV first, and then uh, uh, probably also look at it in the Amplified uh, Translation. So beginning with uh, verse 9, Let love be without dissimulation. Abhor that which is evil. Cleave to that which is good. I'm going to stop just with that one verse. Sometimes we read two or three verses to get a little more of a context of it. But that verse kind of stands alone. Mm -hmm. uh, let love be without dissimulation. Now, brother, uh, I got an app the other day I saved. And I keep it on my screen, keep it handy now, mm -hmm. called KJV Definitions. Awesome. So that some of the words in the KJV, they're kind of, hey, we don't use those words every day. What does that mean? Uh, I've got the definition handy. But before I read the definition, let me just get your thoughts on that verse. Uh, sure, sure. So dissimulation uh, to me, without having the, the definition in front of me, I believe it means um, without um, any kind of trickery or falsity, something like that. I believe that's what it means. Um, I know what abhor means, uh, abhor or avoid or hate that which is evil and cling to that which is good, cleave or cling to that which is good. Um, so uh, we know from other verses in Scripture and we know throughout the whole love letter that the Bible is for us, how important love is. It is considered uh, the most important thing. We're to love God with everything. We're to love our neighbors ourselves. We're supposed to love one another. Um, it, it's throughout. Uh, it's pervasive in Scripture. Um, and we're supposed to avoid evil. We're supposed to cling to that which is good. We're supposed to think of good things, things that are lovely, things that are pure, things that are of good report, etc. Um, so that's what it means to me. It's short and sweet and right to the point. Yeah, okay, thank you. Um, now, I just posted in our private chat space, uh, Brother Cripps, uh, the definition I found from the KJV uh, definitions. Uh, the word dissimulation. So let me read it. Um, you can see it. Uh, I hope you can. You have access. I do. Yep, it's okay. here. All right. It says dissimulation. Is, it's a noun, and it means to make like or like the act of dissembling, a hiding under a false appearance, a feigning, false pretension, mm. hypo hypocrisy. Dissimulation may be simply concealment uh, of the opinions, sentiments, or purpose, but it includes also the assuming of a false or counterfeit appearance, which conceals the real opinions or purpose. Ooh. Dissimulation among statesmen is sometimes regarded as a necessary vice or as no vice at all. Mm. In other words, it's acceptable to use dissimulation sure. in, uh, as a statesman, they would say. Um, but then, they, of course, the reason we're, we're uh, asking for the definition of this word at this time is that it's in this verse, uh, Romans 12, verse 9, we find the word dissimulation. Uh, so let me read it again and keep that definition in mind as I read it again. Let love be without dissimulation. Uh -huh. Abhor, that, that simple word, it just means hate. Matter of fact, I there was a poem I learned when I was a kid called Dried Apple Pies. This person made a poem about how much they hated dried apple pies. Look it up. You'll have a lot of fun uh, reading that poem. I used to have a whole thing memorized and recite it dramatically, but I will say the beginning of it. It's, it says, I loathe, abhor, detest, despise, abominate, Dried apple pies. <laughs> <laughs> this guy really has an issue with dried apple pie. <laughs> so abhor means you hate something very much. Mm -hmm. uh, abhor that which is evil. So Paul is telling us 
don't have dissimulation. We're not we, we're not statesmen, and, and where we can use dissimulation for a, a worthwhile purpose. Uh, no, we need to not to be hypocrites and phonies. Uh, we need to be honest and, and uh, show our real self to the the church, and we should hate everything that's evil and cleave to that which is good. Amen. Uh, let's read it in the Amplified and see uh, if they've come up with any insights there. Yes, it says, love is to be sincere and active. The real thing without guile and hypocrisy. So they got the, that, that's how they uh, were explaining the, the, um, the simulation. Um, Hate what is evil. Detest all ungodliness. Do not tolerate wickedness. Hold on tightly to what is good. Um, yeah, that's a, that's a good, I'm, the Amplified probably 95% of the time, the Amplified is helpful and yeah. that other five or maybe it's even better than that. Maybe one or 2% of the time I find an issue where I'm, uh oh, they got a little Calvinism in their interpretation or they've yeah. got a little Lordship in it or something wrong that you need to be careful of. Yeah. Uh, it's pretty good. Yeah. Um, Okay, so we're we're being told uh, don't be fooling and hypocrites with each other. Uh, yeah, uh, and I just want to add briefly, if you don't mind, brother Luke. So what the Amplified says: uh, love is to be sincere and active. It's a verb. Love is a verb. Um, I love that. I love that it adds that little bit to it uh, because. Um, think about marriages and how important it is to continue to love. It's not just you say, I love you when you're standing up in front of God and everyone else on your wedding day, you continue to love. And then so in reference to the, uh, to verse nine, let love be without dissimulation. Um, it, it, I, I think it's saying that there to live in that place of authentic, open love and not have there be any other hidden or uh, don't hold back. Don't hold back your love from uh, from others. I just wanted to add that a little bit. Thank you. You know, uh, while we're on the subject of the word love, um, I, I think it might be helpful for those people who have not heard me say this before, that uh, when the Bible says that God is love, now you said it's a verb, Mm -hmm. And we, we need to understand that love is also a verb, but <laughs> it, it is also a noun. Yeah. God is love. Um, but uh, to me, the fact that God is love and God is eternal, these two facts, uh, they make me conclude by putting it together. I can have to come to the conclusion the, of the, the Trinity. Because um, love cannot exist uh, without uh, one who is loving and one that is receiving. And there must be an object of love. Or for otherwise, it can't, love can't exist if there's no object of it. <laughs> so uh, that's why uh, we know that even, even with ancient Judaism, uh, they, they believed somehow that God was plural. They believed in one God, and yet it's, God is plural. God is more than one. We, we, we believe that he's he's one God, but he's triune. He's plural, which means more than one, but but more specifically, he's triune. And so this, um, uh, God had to be plural. There had to be a father and a son or a Holy Spirit that before, so that when, when it, God loves, that God hasn't created anything to love. So he, where was this love? What was the object? It was the Godhead itself. God mm -hmm. loved the Son, the Son loved the Father, so on. Mm -hmm. Great point. Uh, all right. Uh, now let's go to verse 10. Be kindly affectioned one to another with brotherly love in honor, preferring one another. Ooh, nice. Mm -hmm. <laughs> what are you smiling? You're smiling. What are you smiling about, Brother Luke? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, first of all, um, this is not an essay by Paul right now. Uh, Paul is not teaching. Paul is instructing and directing, and we could say commanding. Mm -hmm. Paul is telling us how to be, not some theoretical concepts right. about love and kindness. 
uh, he's saying you need to be this way. Be kindly affectioned one to another, one with another. Uh, brotherly love. Uh, let me read it in the Amplified before I ask you to uh, expound on it anymore. He says, sure. be devoted to one another with authentic brotherly affection as members of one family. Give preference to one another in honor. All right, brother, I'll ask you to give me your thoughts on, on all of that. There's a lot in that one verse. Yeah, no problem at all. I uh, appreciate it. Uh, so I mentioned on the above verse, uh, authentic, open love, and Paul's doubling down on that, in my opinion. And the Amplified is picking up on it well. Uh, uh, you know, in verse 9, the Amplified talked about it being the real thing without guile or hypocrisy. And then in verse 10, be devoted to uh, one another with authentic, in brackets, authentic brotherly affection as members of one family, uh, giving uh, preference to one another in honor. Um, this is, this, and I agree with you, This he's not suggesting these things. He, these are statements by Paul. As we've seen in the study, he uses all kinds of punctuation. He uses all kinds of, of methods in the way that he does his, his teaching. Sometimes it's suggesting things. Sometimes he's saying, I beseech you, or I'm, I'm really, really asking you guys, come on. These are just statements. The first one, verse 9, let love be without dissimulation. I mean, he's just st stating it. And in verse 10, be kindly affectionate. I agree with you 100%. He's stating facts. Um, so in the context of the verse, these are just commands for us. Be kindly affectionate one to another with brotherly love and honor. Um, it, it, it both verses, verse nine and ten, have a similar meaning to them, and it's all about just loving each other, and having it be real, having it be authentic. Don't have it be hidden behind things. Uh, don't let it be fake. Don't let it be plastic. Um, and I could go on for a long time about how fake uh, this world is. Um, there's a version of love in the world. Uh, that is completely different and separate from the kind of love that we find in Scripture. You know, it's the love people, no, no matter what their sexual preferences are or whatever their what, whatever their deal is, um, just just love them anyway. And it's a it's a it's a fake love. It's a it's a plastic, um, uh, unreal uh, expectation. And I would prefer to do it like Paul saying how to do it right here. Thank you. Okay, turn my fan off while, I, while I'm i talking here. The, uh, Have you moved your fan a little bit, uh, Brother Luke? Because I've been noticing when you turn your fan on now, it doesn't mess with your mic. Well, I, uh, I'm i muting my mic when I have the fan on. If, oh, when, okay. when I talk, I uh, turn the fan off and then turn my mic on so that okay. we don't have that wind distracting Perfect. everybody. Okay. But, uh of course, then I start getting these hot flashes because I have what the doctor, what the doctor actually used this term. He said, "You've got menopause." Menopause. <laughs> menopause. Oh boy. Jeez. I hope, no, I hope you, none of the other brethren out there, ever get menopause like that. No. But uh, okay, I'm now. I I guess uh, since Paul is uh, directing us, uh, I guess we need to examine ourselves a little bit here, and uh, let's ask ourselves, uh, okay, how well are we doing these things? Mm -hmm. Um, you asking me first? Um, um, yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah I'll, I'll ask you. Uh, loving without dissimulation or hypocrisy, uh, uh, hating evil. Yeah. And 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 be a very kindly affection, feel affection for the brethren, and yeah. preferring preferring the brethren. Yeah. Uh, how well do you do that? Uh, pretty well, uh, most of the time. Um, there are some examples, and I think that we've seen that on this very show before. There are certain people that I have a really hard time loving, uh, and it's it's based on their general attitude and seeing re repeated patterns of things that don't seem to change and um, uh, just hateful comments towards me and attacks and things like that. It's way more difficult in those circumstances, but ultimately, and at the end of the day, in the bottom line, I do love uh, those people, even the difficult ones, even the ones I have a place in my heart for them. But I have to admit that it doesn't come from my flesh. It comes from because I have the Holy Spirit dwelling in me, and that's the only reason. If I didn't have the Holy Spirit dwelling in me, 
people like that, I wouldn't be able to put up with, the, with them for 30 seconds. I would tell them exactly what I think, and they'd be done. That'd be the it. That'd be the end of it. There wouldn't be any patience. There wouldn't be any any consideration or love. But that's not the case. I I, I um, when I uh, do step into the flesh with people that are really difficult to love, I notice it right away, and I and I uh, bring it to the Lord, and I ask Him to help me with it. Uh, but in general, just like all the brothers and, and sisters that are uh, in the chat for the most part and all that, uh, not only do I not struggle with loving them, but I'm filled with a great love, like a brotherly love which talk, uh, is talked about in the Scripture. I think we can all do better. Uh, and my desire is to grow and change every day as I get closer to God and he, as he draws me closer to him. Uh, I want to love more. I want to do better. I want to not be affected by whether someone is uh, making hateful comments or attacking me. I want to be able just to love them the same way I would love someone that, that uh, treats me kindly. Um, so uh, to answer your question, the, the, the longer version is that um, I do pretty well with it, but it's only because of the Holy Spirit that's in me, not because of anything that's in myself. Okay. Well, brother, um, I suspect you're doing better uh, with these things than, than I am. I mean, I really just thank you, Jesus. I'm, I'm, not, uh, I'm not required to do so well with these things that I, and you're, you're asking me to even maybe beseeching us uh, and, uh, and telling us, teaching us this is the way we should be. But we know, thankfully, that, that uh, at least my salvation does not hinge upon how well I can do these things because right. I, I certainly fail. Oh, yeah. Boy, I'll tell you, it's, it's, I made a video. Um, some people probably... Say I, I can't. I'll have to unsubscribe after hearing this. But I, I made oh, no. a, <laughs> I made a video titled um, "Why uh, Most Christians Make Me Sick." Oh, <laughs> I haven't seen this one. Well, how long ago was this? Probably about five years ago. Uh, okay. Yeah. Thing, uh, but you know, I, I I've been on YouTube for ten years, so I, I figure I had I made that after I had years of experience to 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 actually speak on that subject of my, my, my dealings with other Christians, professing believers at least. Yeah. Uh, are they really Christians? Uh, yeah, even even some real Christians can be horrible people. And yeah. it does, it does, I, cannot, I cannot rule out their real Christianity just because they're failures at, at uh, right. loving and, and the, being a good ambassador and so on. Um, but um, yeah, the. Uh, and in that video, I make the point that um, uh, I have found it's easier to get along with than many times with a secular person who has no interest in Jesus or the Bible, but at least maybe they're, they're they, at least they have a basic conscience and moral compass. That you, did, you know, so they they have an idea of what is right and wrong, and they they are attempting to be a kind person. You know, I meet a lot of people like that that. Uh, uh, they're trying to be good, even though they don't think that, uh, uh, you know, uh, God and theology is even relevant. But uh, uh, and there are people who are you know, uh, drug addicts and alcoholics and, and criminals uh -huh. that I found easier to get along with than some of the people in the church and even oh. I would say even in our church. Uh, oh. Now, when I say our church, I'm talking about the congregation here, the Church of the Eternally Secure, all of the people who are regularly participating in this congregation, the Sunday program, uh, the Wednesday night Bible study, and even all those people participating in the the, the talk and doctrine programs. Uh, that's who I see as our congregation. And uh, uh, now, can I do I get along with all these people? Um, for the most part, I do, because I think that um, some of the people uh, have learned to, okay, we don't have to agree on everything, but when we do, we don't have to be disagreeable about it. Uh, you want to express in the chat room that, oh, I think, Brother Luke, you're wrong on this particular question or whatever it is, you feel free to state it and disagree and correct me and uh, tell me how I'm wrong, as long as you're doing it in a respectful way that's not offensive and and that uh, is not hateful. But um, so many times Christians do get in the flesh and get very, very ugly. 
So I've had some very, very bad experiences dealing with many professing believers uh, on the internet. And so I, unfortunately, I, I, but here's the, here's the nice thing. I, I've said this privately to a few people recently too. Look, just because we share of this common faith, we are not required to be friends. Now, um, someone in the chat room, I think it was Step, Patrick Step, just made the comment that can we, is it possible to uh, love someone but not like them? And that's really basically what I'm talking about, uh, Patrick. Uh, the, the, yes, I, I can love someone uh, and feel affection for them. And also, while I'm feeling affection for them, part of the, the, the emotional uh, re, um, response, uh, this affection, is also um, broken heart over the fact that uh, here we are, fellow believers, and yet they are such a hateful person or they're, they've got these issues and they've got to always vent or stir up trouble. I'm not, I don't have any one particular person in mind. And as I said, in our, in our congregation, most of the people have grown enough that we don't have that issue. If you go through any, in any of these chat room uh, comments uh, over the last year or so, you'll, you'll, you'll see that it's a very, very friendly environment that we have. And so uh, we're really not very guilty of this. But in the very beginning, we, we were guilty. We were getting in the flesh with each other. But we've trained ourselves to not do that. Um, so, uh, uh, you know, I wish I could do it all the time. But, oh, the point I'm making, Brother Cripps, is that uh, we do not give up our right, our freedom to choose friends just because someone shares this faith with us. Right. If we meet someone and they, their doctrine's great, we're in complete harmony on doctrine, mm -hmm. and yet they have a personality that is somehow very offensive, and, and, and uh, uh, they're, they're just abrasive or something. And you, you, you can choose to, pref you can prefer another person in the congregation we don't, we're not going to like everybody equally, even though we have love for all, this, this brotherly love that this verse talks about. We're not going to necessarily like everybody equally. Some people may not like them at all. You're free to not necessarily have friendships with everybody in Christianity. Sure. Go ahead. Well, I agree with you. I agree with you that we're not under any obligation to have a relationship with someone necessarily. Um, but I also want to point out that what's what the word Paul is using is love, not like. And yes, there is a difference between loving someone and liking someone. You could be married to someone and love them. And, and maybe over the years, things change. I hope this isn't the case for any married couples out there. But you can not like someone. This can also happen with in-laws. You can love your in-laws because, you know, you're married to uh, their daughter or, or you're married to their husband, whatever the case may be but you don't get along with the with the in-laws so you love them in in a brotherly love type way uh but you don't like to spend time around you don't like them when they come to the house for christmas whatever whatever the case may be but um yeah we're not required in my mind he's not he, he's not talking about he didn't go as deep into it as you did for sure uh, but i agree with you I, I i there are certain people like the one i mentioned uh, that I, I don't feel any need to, you know, buddy up to him and, and you know, try to minister to him and, and try to make things better when I keep seeing the same pattern and it's, it, it's unchanging. There's there's no desire uh, for that person to, to move forward towards me in any kind of love or friendship. Um, so I think loving someone in the way that Paul's talking about is very different than choosing to spend time regularly with someone um, that uh, use the word abrasive. So I'll go with that. An abrasive personality uh, that doesn't seem to, to show you the respect and dignity that uh, you tend to require. Um, I think that's, uh, I agree with your point. And that if people don't agree, that's fine. Um, you can't make people agree with you either. That's the other thing. Um, you can state your points and make them clear and you, you let the chips fall where they may. You, you can't expect people to agree. Mm hmm yeah, uh, I, and this uh, idea of hating that which is evil, I'm going to talk about that here. Uh, I don't recall you uh, giving me your, your thoughts on that, but so let me go first on this concept of hating evil. Okay. Well, 
what is, what is evil? Um, you know, when I observe, now I'm not uh, traveling around the world. I do watch some TV and I see on the news sometimes things that are happening around the world. So, I, But I can't really speak as an expert um, and universally, but I assume that this is probably true everywhere. But I am absolutely disgusted with American society and culture. It does sicken me. It does. I abhor it. Uh, the uh, the degradation of our society. Uh, I, I was watching a, a, some some show uh, earlier to, today, and, and uh, they were the show I was watching wasn't bad, but the advertisement for another show was just so disgusted me. It right. kind of like the attitude of like. Um, uh, the uh, somebody, the housewives of this city or that city, the way that they act, and or uh, let's see, uh, the um, all these reality shows, the way that people are acting in those oh, yeah. shows, and, and that kind of conduct where uh, there is no uh, uh, concern for um, morality, right? And and and, and, and matter of fact, uh, not only are they don't morality doesn't even enter into their mind, but they they don't want anybody else to even bring up the subject. How dare you bring up morality? That's relative, relative right. uh, moral relativity is. Right. is uh, let's not judge anybody else. But I am making a judgment. The Bible tells us to judge, but judge righteous judgment. Mm -hmm. it's not judge is it righteous? Is it good or not? We should be able to use the uh, the principles in the Bible to say, does this meet the principles in the Bible? Mm -hmm. And uh, and if it doesn't. If it, it if we deem that oh it doesn't uh, fit what the Bible says is good in fact really this fits what the Bible describes as evil then I hate it yeah uh, and, and there is such a, a hatred well we're told to hate here brother mm -hmm. I mean people might be offended by that when they say oh no don't you should we shouldn't hate but right here it says it says abhor that means hate as we said. Loathe, abhor, detest, despise, abominate. Yeah. Not just dried apple pies. Right. But, <laughs> but everything that is evil in the world. Yeah. And I find I do have that reaction. Mm -hmm. I do respond to when I see these things, the way our, uh, at least in America, the, the, the way our society is as a almost universally. Now, we have even people who don't even pretend to have any kind of uh uh, re religious faith or foundation of any kind, and and some of them, like the, your your friend on your program, you uh, that your what was his, his name? The Glenn. Friend, what? Glenn. Yeah, Glenn. Yeah. Uh, he, he's a person that probably has a, a, a more sensitive moral compass than mm -hmm. than um, uh, by far all the people I'm I'm referring to. That would apply to Glenn and pe people like him. So there are people who do have a standard of morality that the things I'm talking about would bother them just as much as it bothers me. Indeed. But as a Christian, how can we observe these things in our society without feeling sick and angry about it? It's righteous indignation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. I think I think the the distinction needs to be made. You're you're saying correctly that Paul is saying abhor that which is evil. Uh, we're not to hate the person who is doing evil, and a lot of people get that confused. They rail against people that are evil rather than against the evil that people commit, and that's very important to separate the two. Um, uh, the, the Bible makes it clear uh, how God feels about evil. He cannot be around evil. He cannot be in the same presence uh, with sin. That's, <laughs> that's why he sent his son in the first place, so that we could spend time with him, so that we're not eternally separated from God. So Jesus became sin who knew no sin, so that we could be clothed with his righteousness, uh, because we're not capable of doing that. So he, he took sin, he took evil upon himself and became that so that we didn't have to do it. Um, but uh, I, I agree with you uh, about hating sin. I hate it too. Now, I will admit, since you've been so candid with me about your, uh, your struggle with uh, loving and quote-unquote liking uh, people, um, there are things I know that I'm probably more desensitized to than you. Um, I agree with you. Any uh, wives of any city is absolutely abhorred to me. 
<laughs> I, I don't care about or want to watch any wives in any city. I don't. It means nothing to me. It's ridiculous. And even though it's scripted, it's a script I have no interest in. Um, there are many things I don't have an interest with in award shows anymore. I know that uh, ten years ago I would I would watch the the Grammy sometimes. I would watch the Academy Awards and and uh, I would get some enjoyment on that because I'm a big uh, movie buff. And so I would want to see who won which uh, award and things like that. But nowadays, I can't stomach five minutes of it because it's all symbolism and uh, Satan worship. It, it's so clear to me now, I, I can't put up with it. Um, there are certain types of music that I have no problem with that, that uh, is not uh, stamped with the Christian stamp of approval that I, that, um, that uh, it doesn't disturb my spirit and it, it's no problem. It, it, to me, um, er, everything edifies God because of the way that I see it and I get a message from it that maybe wasn't intended because of the way that I look at things. But there are other types of music I can't listen to for 30 seconds. It's absolute evil. It's putrid, disgusting evil. Um, there, so there are some things I feel like I'm more desensitized to uh, there are levels of evil that I cannot uh, stand for one second. So I could probably use a little bit more discernment when it comes to some of the things uh, that maybe even you, Brother Luke, would consider evil where I would go, well, you know, I don't know. Uh, so I'll ask uh, the Holy Spirit to work on that in me because I, I definitely want to obey the, obey the scripture and um, I want to abhor evil at the same level that, that God wants me to abhor it as well. Um, but I, I'm sure I struggle with some things. I, I, I don't look, uh, because of the way that I see myself, it's not a license to sin by any stretch of the imagination, but I have liberty, uh, and, and I, I, I tend to, to rest in that. And, um, I don't, uh, it's funny cause you said that I didn't, I didn't answer and, and you're right. I didn't, I focused on the love part. And that is, uh, that is a condition that I'm in in general, where a lot of people, they focus on sin so much that I tend not to look at it. I focus on the love part because that's the thing I think means the most. Um, when people uh, think that they're saved and, and what they do is they focus on their own sin. Yeah, oh, I, I had a drink the other night and I'm just all the Holy Spirit's convicted me of it and blah, blah, blah. And they yell at other people. Well, that person, I saw him in a bar and they, they rail against other people. Um, on and on and on and on. I, I don't do that. I focus on, you know, what what's good about the person that's in the bar. What you know, what what kind of things can we look at in their life that that we can um, lift them up a little bit. I tend to focus more on the love part than the than the evil part. But this is a command, so I have to look at it more. Yeah, okay. Well, I I think you are right to uh, focus on it. Uh, you know, Paul. Uh, Someplace else, I don't remember where he said this, but he tells us to think on these things. Mm -hmm. Whatever is good, pure, lovely, good report, mm -hmm. think on these things. Mm -hmm. So our mind, we should try to focus rather on rather than on the bad things, focus on the good things. Get your mind in a good place, keep it there, mm -hmm. and rather than uh, you know being upset and angry and uh, uh, over you know the evil things in the world. Um, but but also, I'm just saying that when we see it, and we, we want to avoid it, we don't want to be in that, that environment, really. No, no, no. Uh, even though Jesus did said that uh, we need to be a light in the world. Don't put your light under the table where it's hidden. You need to put your light on the top so that you know, it can shine and, and give light to people. So we, we actually, we don't need to, uh, we're not really supposed to avoid places where there's sin going on. Uh, but we're, we, when we're there, we, they, people should see a distinction between us. We should stand out like a sore thumb in these places. Um, and people should notice right away there's something different about that person. They're not laughing at these jokes. You know, <laughs> that would be an obvious thing. You know, are, are you laughing at the the... the the, the hateful, dirty jokes, and when everybody's laughing, are you laughing along? Well, if you if you're laughing along, you, know, you probably fit right in. But uh, uh, we we shouldn't fit right in. We should stand out and uh, uh, should be like, wow, this guy has something different about him. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, now, when it says. Um, in honor, preferring one another. 
I, I can honestly say that uh, assuming that someone shares our faith and that they've matured uh, to at least to the point where they are showing this kindly affection, they are not getting in the flesh, not that kind of person, not the kind of the person that I wrote, made my, my video about this Christian, this particular type of Christian makes me sick. I don't want to be around them, but I'm talking about you and many of the people in the congregation. Uh, I actually prefer to spend my time with you. Yeah. Uh, we, we should, if we, if we don't prefer to be around, let's say, oh, these people are just kind of like fuddy duddies, you know, they don't have a sense of humor. Well, yeah, I don't laugh at the, the vulgar profane uh, joke. It's not funny to me. So right. I'm, I'm a funny duddy, you know. Uh, of course you are. <laughs> <laughs> of course you are, brother Luke. Uh, you. Uh, <laughs> but so I, um, I do prefer to be around people who want to talk about Jesus, and not only want to talk about Jesus, but agree with us who He is and how we get saved. When if someone agrees with us on who Jesus is and how do you get saved, uh, and we share this common faith, uh, and and then they also at least have enough maturity and decency as a person to be a, a loving affectionate person instead of a person that's trying to stir up trouble and strife i prefer to be around that kind of person so i don't need to be uh, i'm glad paul's telling us to do that but it does come naturally to me i, I i'm very much desire prefer to be around a believer mm -hmm. rather than someone that well i mean okay I, i've got some friends who are not believers and i can talk about other things but boy, I, I yearn to be able to talk about Jesus all the time with them. And yeah. if they if they let me know that they're not interested in that subject, I have to honor their wishes. I'm not going to keep on trying to force Jesus on them and push them and push end up pushing them away from Jesus. Sure, sure, of course. Um, I want to make a quick point. You brought up brought up Glenn, and I, I want to use him for an example. And he listens to these shows, believe it or not. He he likes to uh, look at the chat and stuff. And and the thing is. He he actually takes the time rather than make just making comments. He takes the time to listen and pay attention to what people are saying. And a lot of Christians don't even do that. They're they're just right there with the criticism, and they just you know come in and say things, and then off they go. Um, they're they're more like trolls than people that really want to get to the bottom of stuff and understand it. Glenn wants to understand it, and uh, there are, there are Christians that I know personally that I would rather hang around with Glenn. And that's sad. I don't want to say that. I want to say that if you're a brother in Christ or a sister in Christ, I would much rather spend time with you than I would hang around someone that claims to be a non-believer. I would. But unfortunately, that's not the case. You have someone, and, and, and you rightly said he has, a, he has a moral compass. And I believe that's because there exists something in the world called the supplemental grace of God that um, people pick up on a, on a moral code uh, because of God's grace, because the Holy Spirit does exist, uh, not just inside believers, but within the, this realm that we live in as well. And, uh, you know, the word says that spirit will not always strive with man. And that's true. There will be a time when it, it seems like it'll, it, you know, it says, find him while he can be found. So there, there seems to be an implication that, uh, you know, toward the end, it'll be, it'll be more difficult. But for now, there's supplemental grace. So people pick up on a moral code. They can have morals and values and not necessarily uh, be, quote, unquote, saved. But then why are people that claim to be claim to be saved, they, they struggle in the area of being authentic and open with each other and being honest without guile, with, without dissimulation, and, and uh, learning how to love people and uh, be respectful and listen to them like Glenn does? Um, I just think it's really sad that, that – uh, that I have a personal example of someone that claims to be a non-believer uh, where his treatment of people is more like what God tells us to act like in Scripture than someone that knows Scripture and says that they believe. It's just unfortunate. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, you probably heard them. Uh, just the, let's say, even the non-believers sometimes will use the, the, the phrase, well, that's not very Christian of you. Right. Christian, how was that? Was that an adverb uh, describing how someone is behaving? That's right. not a Christian of you. Right. 
that's not the way that you expect Christians to, to act. Uh, but uh, yeah, we, uh, I do think though in our congregation here though, I would say that because you're here in the chat room now, and those who are watching this later, you, you, you have an interest in these subjects. You have an interest in uh, spending time with other believers and, and uh, talking about, or at least listening about Jesus and the Bible. Yeah. And so I'd say that's a good indication there that you, uh, you are uh, doing pretty much what these first couple of verses are telling us to do. Mm -hmm. uh, let's go to verse 11. Uh, not slothful in business, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing instant in prayer, yes. distributing to the necessity of saints given to hospitality. I continued because all of that had to go together. Exactly. Through verse 13. We're yep. going to go through it very carefully, but go, let me get your first thoughts on that. Yeah. So the first point, the very first thing he says, gosh, um, there are so many businesses that I've been to and been involved with in some way. And some of them I chose because they have the fish in the phone book. <laughs> you open up the phone book back when they had phone books. I think they still do, actually. I don't know how many people actually use them. Uh, but my, I remember my dad would go through the phone book and when we needed a refrigerator repair man or any, and you know, different trades that we needed to come in. And he literally would look for the businesses that were Christian run businesses. And I think that's a, that that's good. Uh, but then we would get people that would screw us over and they act just like the world. And why, why then do they have a fish in the phone book? Now I, I have more understanding of it now and someone just putting a fish in the phone book doesn't mean that they're actually a Christian business but it gives the impression that they are. So when they do poor business or slothful, as the word is used here, slothful in business, um, you know, it, it's just not good. It puts a stain on uh, exactly what you're talking about. That wasn't very uh, Christian of you or that wasn't very Christ-like of you. Um, the same is applied to uh, people in business. If you're a Christian in any business, you should be working as unto the Lord. That's another command, work as unto the Lord. Uh, and a lot of these businesses don't do that. Uh, so I think that that first point, um, I, I could do a whole show on that because there's so many stories I have uh, where people say that they're one thing and, and, and they don't act in that way. Uh, fervor, fervor in spirit, serving Lord. That just means the general attitude that we're supposed to have. Uh, fervent, we're, we're, uh, fervent um, uh, is also used in prayer and, and, it, and it means just really, really being serious about it, being involved and, and to continue doing it. And then verse 12, I love this. I love all of verse 12, rejoicing in hope. Um, he says in, in, in Romans 5, uh, and we went over that already. It's been, it seems like it was months ago, but um, in, in Romans 5, uh, re, uh, rejoice and hope making thought ashamed, if we remember that. And then the next part, he this is he he's mentioned this before in uh, this particular book, patient and tribulation, patience uh, bringeth patience, or, or, or tribulation bringeth patience, patience experience experience brings hope. So here he is tying these two things again in verse twelve, hope and tribulation. Uh, these these things are go hand in hand. So uh, here here again he's saying when we have tribulation. We cling to our hope. We hope in what God has done, and uh, even in our circumstances. I, I love that. I love that he's bringing that up again when he's brought it up before. And he he constantly does this, Brother Luke, and I know that you see it too. Um, he, he brings up the same points again and again so that we understand them, even all these years, uh, some 2,000 years later. Um, continuing instant prayer. This is praying in, in, uh, in supplication at all times, pray without ceasing. Uh, again, the point is made before, continuing instant in prayer. Instant in prayer, this is an interesting comment to be made. It seems like a more modern word. We want everything in society instant, and apparently it was the same back then when it comes to prayer. We should be ready to pray at any time. Someone comes to us with a problem or an issue, and they're saying, you know, I've really been struggling with this. Whatever that situation is, we should we should be ready at any time to say, hey, brother, hey, sister, do you mind if I pray with you right now? 
Some people don't like that, but most people, even unbelievers, this is interesting, even unbelievers, if they tell you what situation they're going through and you say, hey, do you mind if I pray for you? Nine times out of 10, what do they say, Brother Luke? No, I guess so. I guess that's all right. They don't mind it. So we should be ready to do that at any time. That That is a command, continuing instant in prayer. And then lastly, verse 13, distributing the necessity of the saints. This is giving. This is giving to everyone in the body as needed. And this is the way the, the early church was set up when they brought all their stuff together and they would give to who needed it and no one was in no one was in want. Um, now, some churches are still out there. Brick and mortar churches still do that. They they have programs where they uh, help the widow and give give to the poor and fix somebody's car and stuff like that. Uh, but I've been in churches where they, they don't have things like that. It's not set up like the original church was set up. It's not set up like um, uh, like these early Christians, Christians, to use your term, uh, generally did things. We've gotten so far away from that. And I wish we'd go back to it. I wish that I could join a brick and mortar church and know that if I was dealing with some some kind of uh, problem, something that came up, uh, uh, you know, some car issue that I didn't have enough money to fix, that we'd be able to do that. But here's what I've learned. I am involved in these little church groups that are online. And recently, you're very well aware that I, I had some uh, financial uh, issues uh, while I'm taking care of my grandma. I can't work a full job. And all I did was share it. I, I didn't ask for any help. I just shared it with people. And then without my knowledge, uh, Renee goes out and does a video and uh, told me to set up a, a Patreon account. And people actually gave and actually helped me. So that's working exactly like the scripture is, is uh, saying, distributing to the necessity of the saints, given to hospitality welcoming the people in the, of the body in the church and um, just just uh, applying love and support to their needs. It's fantastic. I love it. That's all. All right. Yeah, that's a wonderful report. Oh, let me turn my fan off. Yes, sir. I bet you heard the fan that time, didn't you? No, nope, actually, I wasn't even paying attention that time. Sometimes sometimes it's it, you can really hear it and it's distracting, but other times I, it, it, I, it seems like you've moved it. You say you haven't, but <laughs> I didn't notice it. I didn't notice it. Uh, okay, let, let me go through this a little more carefully. For, uh, I'm going to also compare this to the Amplified because I see some difference here. And the verse 11 says, uh, not slothful in business. Now, mm -hmm. slothful, of course, is being lazy. Lazy, yeah. Uh, uh, in business, but is it talking about business like your your career or your your working for wages and that kind of a thing? Or, uh, the Amplified doesn't seem to think so. I think it says never lagging behind in diligence. Uh, so that's just talking about business of doing doing taking care of business. You know, hey, you have a list of things to do. You know, if you do make a list of things to do, be diligent. Take care of your business. You know, I'm not, I'm not necessarily talking about your career, the, the, the type of work you do to earn a living, but just the, the, the business that needs to be taken care of in your life, uh, all the tasks that need to be done. Mm -hmm. Get on top of that and, and get it done. Be diligent. Mm -hmm. uh, don't be lazy. Um, and then uh, verse... Um, uh, fervent in spirit, you know, fervent, the Amplified would say, uh, uh, a glow in the spirit. Now, I don't see how a glow is, is a, a glow is something uh, basically a person yeah. can see. This is like someone would uh, recognize this difference in you that we're talking about. When you go to a particular place and you don't fit in with the world, uh, and it becomes obvious your light is shining and they can see this contrast between you and yeah. the world. Uh, and I could say that that would be like a, a glow, you know, yeah. the, the idea of a halo. Yeah. You know, uh, I, I think that um, that that may be what the halo is really indicating that the, 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 this is a saint that has a light that shines. We, right. you know, people when they're around, people can see there's an obvious difference in that person and the rest of us. Yeah. Yeah. Don't you think we all 
as as Christians, we should all have that. It's 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 that um, don't it, it's let your light shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Um, that's the the, the uh, outward sign of the Holy Spirit residing in a person, don't you think? Well, that what you just said that sounds good. That that should be in the Bible. It is. <laughs> it totally is. I didn't come up with that on my own. I'm not okay. that smart. <laughs> Okay, then in verse, uh, and it says, serving the Lord. Mm -hmm. So here it says, not slothful in business, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. So rather than thinking of being, don't be lazy about your plumbing business or your architecture business or something, is take care of business in the, your ministry, in mm -hmm. your service to the Lord. Mm -hmm. I, I think it's probably, I'm more inclined to think it's talking about that. And uh, I, I said this, many times before but uh, when you put your faith in jesus and the holy spirit entered you and uh, you uh, uh came alive spiritually um uh, guess what you just clocked in yeah <laughs> you're on the payroll now welcome and now you're busy working and building up treasures in heaven yeah uh, you've got you got a job to do you don't know what to do mm -hmm. well pray to the lord every day Continual instant in prayer, and uh, the first prayer should be, Lord, what's my calling? What are you calling me to do? How do I fit into this body of Christ? What part do I play? And, and, and I wouldn't pray anything else until, until I got the answer on that. Yeah. When you got the answer and you know what your role is in the church, then uh, don't be slothful. Mm -hmm. Be fervent. Okay. And uh, now verse 12, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, Continue instant in prayer. Well, let's re rejoicing in hope. Uh, see, this is, I talk about this a lot. We talked about this before we went live. And yeah. you asked me how I am. I, 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 I am rejoicing all the time. I, it's, I'm 68 and I'm happier today than I was yesterday and happier this year than it was last year. My happiness is just growing all the time. Yeah. And I, I feel horrible for the people who don't have this joy, this, this happiness and this peace. Right. And sometimes that's because of all the, the tribulation that we're going to talk about next, that we all have our tribulations and don't think I don't have it. I had to have brain surgery, yeah. uh, three back surgeries, open heart, quadruple bypass surgery. Uh, I've had my tribulations. I've had reasons for my joy to be taken from me. And I've had my questioning of God, why are you, why are the prayers unanswered? Why do I continue to have these, these problems? And, yeah. and then not only that, they fix me and then there's complication after complication. I'm questioning God. So yeah, we're, um, I realize how blessed I am in spite of the fact that I have problems like everybody else. Uh, and yet I have this joy all the time. Yeah. And it, I, I feel bad for the people who don't have it. But this re rejoicing in hope, well, uh, mm -hmm. you know, most people think the word hope means, uh, well, I hope it happens. Uh, there's a 50-50 chance something's going to happen. Uh, I'm hoping it does. But um, I don't think when we see the word hope regarding our, our, our Christianity, that it's talking about, let's keep our fingers crossed hoping for that. No, it, it, it's, it's our, our thinking of it as a promise. Uh -huh. God's got made promises for us and our hope or our trust is, is in that, that promise. We yeah. believe he's going to keep those promises to us. Yeah. And so that's how I would look at the word hope in these cases. Now, patient in tribulation. Here's another thing, brother. Um, uh, you know, I made that video about, I'm still very, very disappointed. I, I, I don't know. If, <laughs> I've already started. I guess I'll, I'll say it. Uh, <laughs> Too late. <laughs> uh, I made a video titled um, Be Quick to Listen, Slow to Speak. Uh, no, I'm sorry. That's, this, it's a related subject, but that's not the one. I'm talking about teachers. Um, will you listen and learn? I, I forgot the title. Maybe if you've seen the video, maybe you can tell me what the title was. I probably made no. it about three or four months ago. I'm talking about teachers. Will you, are you still able to learn? Mm -hmm. Or are we so caught up in our own teaching that we're not taking time to listen to each other? Oh, my gosh. That's such a great point. Brother, I, I cannot tell you how much time every day I'm listening to all of the, the videos of, of all these people in our congregation. And every day someone says, hey, 
Brother Luke, here's someone. Will you check this guy out? And I ended up going to watch their videos and listen to them. Mm -hmm. And and guess what? There's another video. I, the one I was mentioned first is that um, be quick to listen, slow to speak. Eight times I changed my mind. Or, 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 you know, on, on, on a theological doctrine. Right. Uh, and and that, that only happens. You're not going to change your mind unless you are willing to listen to other viewpoints. Right. And, uh, and we've got a lot of people in our congregation mm -hmm. that have varying viewpoints. Yeah. I have some viewpoints that are very much a minority viewpoint. Agreed. And, and, and well, what are you going to do? You say, well, that's not the, that's not the, uh, what's called, uh, um, um, that's not orthodox. Right. That's not traditional. Mm -hmm. Oh, well, okay. It's heterodox. It's out of the norm, mm -hmm. but why don't you consider it? Maybe that maybe tradition's wrong. Sure. Maybe the majority viewpoints wrong. I mean, after all, isn't the majority wrong about uh, God and anyway? Yeah. yeah. The majority of the world doesn't believe in God and the Bible the way that we do. No. We're a tiny little probably 3% of the world. So if we were said, well, it's not the majority. It's not the traditional viewpoint of the world. Their viewpoint of the world is that, well, there's a, uh, if, if there is a God and there is a judgment, you'll be, you'll be, you'll be good enough. If you're good enough, you're going to be okay. Mm -hmm. And um, that's contrary to biblical Christianity. So our viewpoint is a tiny little minority viewpoint, and yet we hold it and trust it and defend it. Uh, yeah. Or will you consider other minority viewpoints? Uh, now, when I, the reason I got into this subject, and I still don't see many of the people I know in our congregation willing to look at another viewpoint. Uh, you, you told me you're watching my playlist on Job. I, I'd like to get a report on how you're doing on that sometime. Yep. Uh, and uh, someone else told me, oh, yeah, Brother Daniel, on Sunday, we got into a discussion about uh, James and a person was asking us how to answer these all these like dozen verses in James two, and uh, we each gave our own account. And my account, my my interpretation of it is totally different than everybody else's. And but Daniel said to me, he said, "Well, brother Luke, I, I'm going to watch your your videos on that." And I have I'm altogether I probably have like twenty or thirty hours or more on that subject. It that there's that much to to it. To, 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 I think, prove my point of view. Right. And um, so he says he's going to look into it and consider it. But he says, Brother Luke, what if I find something and there's a hole in it and, and, and I show you about it? Will you reconsider your position? I said, of course. Yeah. Of course I will. Yeah. You think if, if someone proves me wrong, I'm going to be a stubborn fool and hold on to an error out of well. pride? No, the reason I changed my mind in the first place is because some people took the time to show me how I was wrong and prove it to me. And I, then I studied it and realized I was wrong. Mm -hmm. So I'm still willing to reconsider all these positions. And one of the positions I changed, the reason I went off on this tangent, brother, is because it talks about tribulation. Mm -hmm. Now, it says patient and tribulation. This, this uh, points out to me, supports my point of view, that the idea of in eschatology of uh, dispensational futurism that there will be a seven-year tribulation period uh, uh, that i i believe uh, i accepted what i was taught by the experts i defended it and taught it for 25 years and then after studying the other points of view on it i moved away from that and i have a different viewpoint right so now uh when when i see the word tribulation my thought is well, uh, a lot of people think, well, this tribulation applies not to the saints. Saints won't go into tribulation. Well, what happened to every one of the apostles? Yeah. Every apostle went through tribulation and horrible things and even martyred them. Even John was martyred in suffering, yeah. not, uh, not murdered, but right, he right. suffered. Yep, he suffered. All through yep. early church history. Read Fox's Book of Martyrs. I did. Re contemporary version of that is uh, Jesus Freaks, Volume 1 and 2. Read that. People even today are still in tribulation all over the world for their faith in Jesus. Yes, they are. Uh, so 
don't get this idea that uh, we're going to be somehow spared a future tribulation period when we've never been spared for 2,000 years. We've always had tribulation, yeah. not only as Christians, but just in life as a general rule. It says right here, we, we need to be patient in going through tribulation, these trials and difficulties of life. We're not going to be, we're not promised. You know, someone came to my home Bible study like 15, 20 years ago, and he said, he was new and he said uh he was started wanted to teach us he was just a young guy this, this i wasn't even old as old as i am now back then but even then <laughs> of course you were. sometimes these young punks sorry for all these young people that I'm <laughs> thinking, uh, yeah, there's a lot of them in the oh, chat yeah. come on if you're young realize that you're young not only in years but in study you don't have that much study in your under your belt so be a little bit humble be willing to listen to someone who's maybe older and has studied more and yeah. then that came to the bible study he started well he wanted to correct the whole congregation talk to us about this verse that says that uh, uh jesus came to uh, give us life and give it more abundantly mm -hmm. he wanted to teach us about the prosperity gospel mm -mm -mm. And that how we are, we're all supposed to be blessed. And I said, okay, I agree. Uh, uh, Paul got an abundant life, an abundance of suffering. Yeah. That's why his life, he had an abundant life of suffering. Yeah. He was beaten three times with yeah. clubs, bitten, got 39 lashes three times, shipwrecked, yeah. snake bitten, stoned and left for dead and finally beheaded. Yeah, mm -hmm. he had an abundant life as a Christian. Yeah. Of Amen. suffering. Yep. Of tribulation. So, but we need to be patient in our tribulations, knowing that we're all going to go through these tribulations. Be patient and understand that our life, the Bible says, our life is like a vapor. It yeah. appears for a short time and then disappears. Yeah. Uh, 70 years, says we get three score and 10, 70 years. If you get more than that, uh, you know, that's a gravy. That's icing on the cake. And uh, uh, during that time, it's going to come by like that. Yeah. I remember when I was a little boy, I was born in 1950. For some reason, my brain did the math when I was a little kid. I thought 50 years will be 2000, like some distant point in the yeah. future. It was 50 yes. years. The millennium period, the year 2000, some monumental event. When I'm 12 years old, I'm thinking about that. I said, yeah. I will be 50 years old at that time. Yeah. And, and guess what? It's come and gone, long time in the past. I'm 68 now, and every year is going by faster than the one before. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, whatever we're going through now is like this. Yeah. It's just nothing compared to what we are promised in eternity. Amen. And Amen. then uh, I, I, I want to talk about continuous in prayer more, but sure. me, I'll just pause because I've said a lot and get your your thoughts. Well, yeah. I mean, well, first there's there's plenty of things to to. Um, to uh, comment on and all that you just said. Uh, one of the things I, I, I want to touch on briefly, you know, I had a birthday yesterday. I'm, I'm, I'm sure you're aware of it. So you said being 50, <laughs> like, like 50 for me is already come and gone. And my birthday was yesterday. It's <laughs> come and gone. It was, it was, it was here. And now it's gone. It's a vapor. So next I've got 51. Um, uh, I, I did the same thing. You're talking about being a kid and, and thinking about the future. Uh, just tell a quick story. There was a time capsule at our local movie theater that my buddy and I used to go to. In fact, we saw Star Wars there in, in the mid '70s, and they had this this time capsule there, and it was going to be opened in two, 2010. And he and I, my buddy and I, have talked about, oh, we'll be old. We'll be, you know, like we'll be in our, our 40s or whatever it was. And we just felt like it was so long. It's like, well, you know, we have to wait that long until we get it. And then when they finally opened the time capsule, neither one of us were able to go. We didn't actually see it happen. I watched it on video, actually, on uh, Channel 3, the local channel. Um, but I remember exactly what you're talking about, thinking about how far away that age was, how far away it was. And it seems like nothing. And I remember that this, this story that I'm talking about, I remember standing there looking with my buddy standing and looking at this time capsule that they had in the ground with the, with the brass uh, plating, which with etching on it saying when the time capsule was going to be open. And he and I just look at each other saying, Oh my gosh, that's forever. That's forever from now. 
And it's not. This life is a vapor. It does come for a short time. We're promised 70 years. Anything else is gravy. That's absolutely correct. Some people do live longer than that. But this is a vapor. And in in the when you compare it to eternity, though, I, I don't know if people can wrap their minds fully around how long eternity is. Um, it actually says time will be no more. There's no existence of time. There's no time. We're not going to look at our watches or our cell phones and see what time it is in heaven. We're not, it's not going to exist. It literally won't exist. So, and that, that uh, state of being lasts forever. No, no longer will we uh, have the same constraints of time that we have now. Right now, time in some ways, everyone serves time. Everything is about how much time we have, a wasted time. I want to make up some time. You know, do you have time to do this? Do you have time to do that? Everything is governed by this uh, by this time thing, and eventually we're, it's not even going to be a factor. Um, I also, going back to uh, what you said about slothful in business, and, you know, I uh, understand your concept of it, and I, I just want to add to that. It seems like um, it's just any any kind of business. Whatever business a believer does, I think that's what it refers to. You refer to as ministry, and I know where you're, stances on that and i and i have no problem with that I agree that i certainly agree that everyone i liked what you said about you know when you when you become a christian you know it's like someone says okay you know welcome you're on the clock i i love that um and when you said that i thought too it's like someone going on their they're on the battlefield now and you hand them a sword and some armor and say okay you're in the battle now let's get to it get on the battlefield just had that mental mental image um, I, I love all your comments, but the the one that uh, the one that stuck out to me is the whole the whole time capsule, how quickly time moves by. So that's the one I want to comment on. Thanks. All right, thank you. Um, I will. I'm trying to as you talk, listen, and peruse the chat room too. I noticed that uh, Hendrix uh, recommended everybody watch the playlist. Of, of, I made 50 hours in heaven. Mm -hmm. Uh, I've mentioned it many times, and I guess because I mentioned it, Brother Hendricks uh, has been watching it. I don't know if he's gotten through it or not yet completely, but I, he has reported to me that he's been uh, listening to it. Awesome. Uh, uh, it's quite quite a challenge to take on, though, because the reason it's titled 50 Hours in Heaven is because the playlist, is the content is actually 50 hours long. Yeah. It took 50 hours to do the study and teaching on heaven. Yeah. Now, if you uh, let me ask everybody, have you ever been to any church where they did a sermon, a whole sermon, not just a reference, but the whole sermon was about heaven? No, uh, no. Most, most churches don't talk about heaven. They'll be glad to talk about hell a lot, but oh, they don't go to talk about heaven and they don't. Uh, if they do, they'll mention it. And if they ever did a sermon on heaven, that's it. That's all there is to it. And they never yeah. they mention it again. Yeah. People said to me in the beginning, after like three or four hours, someone commented, I remembered, wow, how could you talk this long about heaven? And I said, we just scratched the surface. And it turns out yeah, it took 50, hours, 50 hours to discuss the subject of heaven. Mm -hmm. But uh, if you are someone that we've been, you know, talked about earlier, that uh, is struggling with uh, uh, depression, and you, you're losing your joy, and uh, I, I really, I think that playlist mm -hmm will help you more than any, anything else. Probably, the, i say this is the happiest time I've been, but I remember how happy I was when we were doing the study on heaven. Yeah. Uh, we're studying the, uh, what, what promised for us, what eternity is going to be like for us. Studying that will make you happy. Amen. It sure will. Um, so the next uh, point I want to talk about is uh, this phrase, continuing instant in prayer. Now, uh, you know, grammatically, uh, I, I, you would probably say that it's incorrect. It should be continuing instantly in prayer. Um, but um, uh, I, I would say that um, the, the way that verse makes sense to me is that um, we are, there's another verse you mentioned, brother, it said uh, continually pray, right? I, yeah. Is that what it says, continually pray? Um Pray continuously. Well, uh, are you praying right now? Or are you listening to me? I'm listening to you. 
You're not praying now, so you're not, you're not continuing to pray all the time, are you? We don't no. we continue to pray all the time. We have other things that we have to do, and our mind has to be occupied with the task at hand. Right. What this verse is telling me is instantly continue in the prayer that you should start every day when you open your eyes. Mm -hmm. When I wake up, and this is not to give myself an accolade, when I open my eyes, I begin praying every day. And uh, then life takes over. You get busy. You got to take care of all this stuff. And then when, as soon as I remember, my mind is freed up. I'm thinking, oh, Jesus again. And talking to Jesus and thinking about Jesus and thinking about the prayer needs of the congregation. And the, instantly, we need to train ourselves to instantly, when our mind is freed from the work, work that's part of us, as soon as our mind is freed, instantly continue in this prayer that should last all day long. Amen. I, th I for me, and this is just for me, nobody else. I think it's a it's a continual attitude of being able to talk to God any moment of any time of in, uh, of the part of the day or or the evening. Um, I I uh, this isn't bragging. This is just the relationship I have with God. Is that um, sometimes I'm driving down the road and I'll just turn the radio down and uh, just talk to Him. Uh, certainly, first thing I love, and you and I have talked about this before, I think on another show, but you were talking about getting up first thing and praying. And um, I haven't always done that, but um, I'm fortunate to have at least grown up in a family that did pray. Um, we prayed before we went to school. We prayed before taking road trips. We, you know, we prayed at meals. We prayed it in the evening. So there was a lot of prayer. So I, I grew up seeing that modeled. And I've um, uh, done that in my own uh, journey, in my own path with God uh, as well. But um, can I pray more, more often? Yes, absolutely. We can always pray more. And uh, people seem to get the idea that uh, w when it refers to praying, that it means we have to be on our knees in prayer in the prayer closet the whole time. No, no, uh, we can't. He understands that we can't all be in the prayer closet 24 hours a day. We have to have jobs. We have to have, you know, we have families, we have friends, we have ministries to, to deal with. Um, to me, it's an attitude. This verse is an attitude of prayer and be prepared to pray at any moment. That's what it means to me. Uh, but uh, generally, I love your, your attitude of waking up first thing and praying and just I wake up and thank God that my heart's still beating and then I'm awake again because I realize, at least for me, I realize that any time I have on this uh, in this realm is given to me by God because I see him as the one that provides all things. He created all things. He provides all things. He holds all things together. And so for me, I'm thankful when I wake up. I'm thankful I didn't I, I didn't die. Now I'm ready to go to heaven. I'm ready anytime. Anytime he, he's ready to take me, whenever my appointed time is, I'm like, let's make this thing happen. Yes, there are things that I would like to experience uh, yet in this life. There's some things going on in my life right now that are very exciting, and I want to be part of those. But he decides. I don't decide. I try to stay healthy. I'm getting healthier every day. Uh, I avoid things that, are, that I know are bad for me uh, for the most part. Um, but I, I know that I don't have control over that. It's in his hands. So when I do wake up, I want to first thank him uh, and, and uh, share that time with him and just be thankful that, my, that I'm awake and alive and that he has a plan for my life. It's just wonderful. Well, I, I like what you said in your first comments on, on prayer uh, that uh, uh, when you pray for someone that, and you ask, well, can I pray for you now? Yeah. Uh, I don't remember anybody ever saying no. Mm -hmm. uh, I guess if someone's what we call a um, anti-theist, yeah. not, an, not an atheist. Right. An atheist is someone that says, "Well, I don't believe in God, but I'm, right. I'm not, you know, on a campaign to, you know, prove him, prove there's no God, and it's not a mission in their life. They hate the concept of God. These are anti-theists." But your average atheist or not agnostic, even they probably would, uh, you know, they might be laughing and, and under their breath and oh, well, go ahead, can't do any harm, you know. Uh, but uh, the idea that you uh, eagerly are asking people, can I pray for you? Mm -hmm. Say, yeah, yeah, they allow you to pray for them. That's a wonderful thing. I, I, I confess I don't do that. Uh, I pray for people, but I do it without asking. I just pray for them as I'm talking to them. 
I have okay. in my mind. That's how I do it. I, I, I think it's probably would be better if I told them I'm, I'm going to pray for you right now. And, and oh, interesting. Pray for them out loud. Yeah. 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 I th because, because I think that when you pray for someone, at least I know for me, when someone prays for me, I, I feel it. I feel the Holy Spirit working when, when a, uh, a brother or sister puts their hands on me, especially, and they're praying for something I'm going through in my life. And I close my eyes. I'm I'm in that with them because we know that the Holy Spirit is with us in that situation for sure because He dwells in us and and He delights in that. And I actually can feel it. I not that I feel some kind of power coming out of the person's hand or anything like that. I'm saying that I feel the prayer going up to the Father. I feel that. So for a person, whether they're saved or not, I think that 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 uh, gesture of um, saying to them, "Can I pray for pray for you?" I think that makes them feel cared for, regardless of what their belief system is. And it's it's uh, a moment that we're able to connect to someone in a way that maybe that no one else has done before. And that uh, I think that's meaningful, and I think it's a good thing to practice, that's all. Yeah, uh, you know, I've, I've started making these announcements. Uh, people, send me your, your favorite one-liners. I'm making a list of great one-liners. Uh, also... Uh, tell me if you want to share any miracle. Uh, I want to do a program where we all talk about the mir miraculous things that uh, we've had in our lives. And um, But regarding prayer, I, I made a video titled Signs and Wonders, where I, I give an account of, I think, maybe five different miracles that I've experienced. And these miracles were the result of praying and getting a miraculous answer. I mean, it was... Uh, you can watch that video, but I'm going to tell you more about how the prayer was answered. It's so dramatically. And that's why I, I always ask the Lord, please do the, answer this prayer. Not only answer it, yes, but do it dramatically. Make it so outrageous. <laughs> Lord, make it so great of an answer that no one could think it's just a coincidence. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, distributing to the necessity of the saints. I think your example there of how uh, Renee helped you and then others helped you, and, uh, and that's a wonderful example of what we're called to do in this church. And uh, given to hospitality, there's another, there's a verse Paul talks about um, given we should be hospitable to strangers. Sometimes it's an angel and you don't even know it. It's right. I mean, God somehow is like giving us some kind of a test or something. And at the judgment, maybe, maybe uh, we'll, this, we'll see a video of, uh, Hey, remember that time you didn't help that guy. That was an angel I sent to you. <laughs> <laughs> no, one wants that. no one wants to hear that from God. That's for sure. Are, are we being hospitable? Uh, you know, I, I, part of this is also has, I, I think are, we're a little bit, our hands are tied because unless you're single, you have to also answer to your spouse too. And they have to be in agreement how us, hospitable you're, you can be. Um, if I took in some strangers into my house that I, my, I, my wife would be, would freak out and just, you know, she, she would never put up with it. It would be war. Uh, so yeah, yeah right. <laughs> we probably we, we do have some limitations, but there are uh, many ways that we can show hospitality mm -hmm. uh, to people and, and kindness, and we should. Amen. Uh, now verse um, fourteen says, "Bless them." Okay, this is where we left off. Okay, yeah. let me read this and get your thoughts here. Bless them which persecute you. Bless and curse not. Wow, brother, can you do yeah, that? Well, Yep. Bless them which persecute you. Um, I'll use the same example I <laughs> used earlier. When you have someone that uh, seems to have your number, they don't like that you uh, don't um, uh, facilitate their behavior and celebrate that the, that they're um, acting in a certain way, and they're calling you out and persecuting you and saying mean things and untrue things about you. Paul's command here is not, it's not comfortable to me. Bless them which persecute you. Bless and curse not. It's, it, this is a command. It's not a suggestion saying that we should bless them. And uh, other word, um, in other places in Scripture, it says, um, uh, I think Jesus uh, said that. Is it in the, the Sermon on the Mount uh, where he's talking about, um, 
Oh, I can't. I lost it. I talk about a, a brain fart. Is that what happens when you turn fifty? You're you're running down a trail on a thought and just pops right out of your head. Well, I, I was going to say something about this birthday uh, earlier. I'm glad you mentioned it again. I wanted to make a public correction. Uh, oh, let me turn the fan off. Uh, okay, everybody in the chat room. They, a lot of people are saying, "Here's balloons and a party. Happy birthday, brother Chris." <laughs> Yeah, that was nice. Thank you, guys. In chat room, I'm sorry to have to tell you this, but Brother Cripps, unfortunately, has misled you. you know, <laughs> yesterday was not his birthday. I hate to be the one to, you know, correct him publicly like that. Uh, <laughs> yesterday was not your birthday. Yesterday was the 50th anniversary of your birthday. <laughs> okay. Yeah, that's true. Technically, that's true. You were not born yesterday. You're I not, was not. You were in the hospital in the nursery. Nah. <laughs> Thank God I wasn't. I don't want to be anywhere near hospital. I'm doing that for a that's true. No, that's, that's true. Also, another thing uh, I'll correct too. Um, I'm actually, I'm living my 50th year. Technically, I just ended living my 49th year. So I'm currently in, in just starting my 50th year. It's not that I've lived 50 years. And and it's over. That that won't happen until I'm fifty one. Do the math; you'll figure it out. I I think when you turn one, you've lived your first year. Correct. So when you turn fifty, you've lived your fiftieth year, haven't you? Hmm. When when you go from from not, one is the beginning of counting. Like before that, they do months, right? And they still do sometimes. The someone will ask you how old your baby is, and they'll say twenty two months. Like is I think when you're one years old, you've lived one year. So if yeah. you're ten years old, you live ten years. If you're fifty years old, you've lived fifty years. Hmm. Think about it. I'm gonna okay. think about it. I'm All right. About it. Let's go to the next verse. Uh, Thanks for correcting me though on my happy birthday. <laughs> I just took the joy out of your happy birthday. Now. No, I still have joy. No one has the power to take my joy, brother Luke. Okay. All right. Um, now, bless them which persecute you. You know, when you mentioned Jesus, um, be while you were before you said that, my mind went to Jesus too. It's, I said this sounds like he could be quoting Jesus. Yeah. Uh, he, these. This is not a direct quote, but he's basically paraphrasing the teachings of Jesus. You know, Jesus said, "Love your enemies, turn the other cheek, uh, other things." And, and where did he say it? I don't remember exactly. It was it the Sermon on the Mount, or maybe part of that would uh, um, fall under this uh, this verse here. But uh, yeah, Paul uh, he teaches he's teaching here a lot of principles that Jesus also taught uh, yeah. how how we should be living, how God desires for us to to conduct ourselves. It's something about uh, love them that that persecute and say all manners of evil against you falsely for my sake. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe someone in the chat room can find the verse. And... Yes. Okay. Um, all right. Uh, can can we do it though? Bless them which persecute you. Um, I don't know. I've I've had a lot of people persecuting me uh, in, in on these ten years on YouTube. Sure. And still, some still some persist today in, in persecuting me. Yeah. I'm not the only one. All of us who are. Um, uh, first of all, if we're if we're preaching the real gospel, we have the majority of people that are going to be uh, calling us liars and and uh, false teachers. But uh, even the people who agree with our doctrine, our, our gospel, you know, on other things, they don't tolerate differing opinions. So then they're going to persecute us and call us false teachers. So I'm not the only one that that suffers from that. But I will. Uh, how do I respond? Uh, I'm sorry, Lord. I'm sorry. I failed. I'm not blessing them. I haven't blessed them. I don't remember blessing them at all. I right. better, better work on that. Yeah. Uh, what I've what I've tr learned to do, and what I've I tried to tell everybody else to do, is uh, ignore them, yeah. because um, you don't want to engage, and and uh, sometimes then you end up getting in the flesh, and it steals away your joy and your time. Yeah, your time, uh, your time. You know, I've said this many times too, because as I've gotten older, it becomes much more, more important to me. My time is very valuable. I've even had people say to me, "Well, why can't you answer my question?" 
uh, <laughs> your, is your time more valuable than mine? Yeah. And I said, well, I don't know how valuable you think your time is, but my time is very valuable to me. I, I already invested 10 hours on a playlist on the subject you want me to talk about. Right. Uh, so do you want me to write a, a, a co little comment back to answer your question when it took me 10 hours to answer it? Yes. You know, and and uh, yeah, yes, my time is valuable. I've already put the time in to give you the answer. If you're too lazy or stubborn to go look at the playlist to see my answer, then I don't have time for you that. Okay. But uh yeah, I guess I, need I want to you to answer all my questions in, on my time, Brother Luke. Yeah. Not your time. Yeah. <laughs> I want you to go through it while I'm sitting here talking to you. I don't want to go watch your videos. I want you to explain it to me. I, I, I will say, Lord, okay, I, I have done the second half here. It says, uh, bless them which persecute you, bless and curse not. Uh, the people who I have in mind here... Uh, I'm not cursing them. I'm just trying to ignore them, mm -hmm. not, 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 not let them steal my time. And my right. focus. Of I made a video, one of my oldest videos uh, was, let's stay focused on Jesus. Let's you do. start engaging all these people and your focus is not on Jesus anymore. You can't walk on water if you take your eyes off of Jesus. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can't. Yeah, I've talked about that several times, and I heard our, our friend uh, Michael, Brother Mordecai, talking about that same uh, thing that you've heard me mention. I refer to all the time about the Christian life, the Christian life, and how people get distracted because they keep they they don't keep looking at Jesus. Uh, the the idea of Peter walking across the water, that very thing, and he did it while he was looking at Jesus, while he was believing and trusting in Jesus. Uh, the minute he uh, looked at his circumstances and realized that he was literally walking on choppy water, uh, that's when he began to sink. And what happened? Jesus reached up and, and grabbed him and brought him to safety. And that's the way he does uh, with us. Uh, he didn't scold him. He just said, oh, you have a little faith. Uh, he didn't say, oh, you horrible, wretched person. You're never going to get it or, you know, anything like that. Uh, because he loves us and he wants us to uh, keep our eyes on him and trust him. It's very clear. Yeah. Uh, this is a picture here. Look at look at this. You see that? Yeah. That's a, a picture of what, what happens at, that uh, uh, Peter was sinking. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Jesus yeah, grabbed him and pulled him up from certain Beautiful. Past. And Beautiful. it's also a picture spiritually of uh, us. Uh, Jesus is offering his hand in self for salvation for us. And we just need to embrace him for, for it. Realize that he, uh, if, if we grab hold of him uh, for our salvation, he says he's never going to let go. He never does, brother. Yeah. I believe that promise. I believe all the promise, but that one especially. Because if I don't believe that uh, the, the words that Jesus speaks and when he, when he says that I will never leave you or forsake you, then I'm not sure I believe any of it because that's the hope that we have is in Christ Jesus. The hope that the, the hope that we're told to have, you're right. It isn't, it isn't like I hope or cross my fingers and hope something works out. We're hoping in the promises that he's given us. Isn't that correct? Yeah. Yeah. That, that's why when we were talking privately before we went live, we're talking about, uh, you know, the essence of what the gospel really is. And it, it's the good news that we do have this certainty, this guarantee. I'm guaranteed I'm going to have eternal life in heaven. I'm guaranteed it. Nothing can change that. That's right. Unless you understand and believe that this is guaranteed to you, promised by Jesus himself directly to you, mm -hmm. unless you understand and believe that, you don't know the gospel at all. Mm -hmm. That's right. Okay. Amen. I agree. Uh, now, verse 15 says, Rejoice with them that do rejoice, and weep with them that weep. Mm, yes. Some of this sounds like a little bit like out of Proverbs, too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, verse 15, rejoice with them that rejoice. This is, this is so simple. If a brother or sister is excited about something in their life, be excited with them. It's not hard. Someone says, hey, brother, I just got a new job. So great. I'm so glad you got a new job. Tell me all about it. And if they're, if they're sad, if they're saying, oh, you know, I just broke up or I'm going through a divorce or you know, I'm really struggling with my health or whatever, and they're and they're weeping or they're or they're sharing that with you. Be with them. Say, "Oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. That's that's horrible." 
and have it be authentic, please. Just have it be authentic. And it can be authentic if we follow what Jesus said, love the Lord your God with everything and love your neighbors yourself. If we're loving our neighbors ourselves, we're going to have that built-in love for them that comes from the Holy Spirit. So if they're happy, we're going to be happy with them. If they're sad, we're going to be sad with them. And it's okay. You don't have to carry that sadness around with you. That's not what it's saying. It's saying in a moment, weep with them. Uh, have the ability to to uh, come alongside them. I've said that before many times. Come alongside them. And I wish that, that more Christians would uh, understand that concept. It doesn't mean you have to... Uh, step into that with them and and take take on their their weeping or uh, or anything. It's just saying, um, share that with them. It's pretty simple and straightforward in my opinion. But there it is. Uh, well, in in Proverbs, it, uh, it clearly states that uh, if if you see someone mourning, you don't try to cheer them up. Right. The last thing you want to do if someone just let's say they lost their loved one, mm -hmm. and you don't want to go in there and tell them, well, like Calvinist would say, well, it's God's will. No, oh, gosh, will. please don't say that. Yeah, that's what a Calvinist would have to say. Yeah. And uh, uh, but we don't want to even say that. Well, all good, uh, all all good things happen to those who uh, love the Lord. How mm -hmm. does that verse go? Um. All, all things work together for good for those that uh, love yeah. God and are called according to his purpose. Yeah. yeah, you don't want to just quote that verse when people are mourning. That would be trying to cheer them up. No, if there is a time for everything, a season, as it says in Ecclesiastes, there's a time to mourn, and you, you, they need to let them mourn. In fact, we're told not only let them mourn, don't cheer them up, mm -hmm. but mourn with them. Yeah, um, absolutely. Just, just sitting there and hug them and mm -hmm. cry if you're if you're mo if it's real if you really feel yeah. it just go ahead and cry right along with them absolutely the last thing you should be doing is trying to tell them that all things will work for the good for those who love the lord don't yeah them. yeah please don't say that and also please when someone dies don't say jesus needed another angel first of all it's theologically incorrect uh and also it's mm -hmm. not something someone needs to hear when they've lost someone that's very important um just just stand with them, come alongside them in their grief. That's all that you have to do. And and one last thing while you're talking about that, I thought about the relationship between men and women. A lot of times women, when they're dealing with things, they're, they're generally, and this is a generalization, folks, generally women are, are more emotional than men. There are circumstances where that, that doesn't apply. So I'm, this is just a general statement. So when a woman shares with, with her man something that's that they're upset about, uh, the man uh, goes into fixing mode that, rather than listening. They want to fix it. So what I've learned to do, uh, this has taken me uh, a long time to do that, but I've, I've learned how to do this when a person, even if it's not someone I'm necessarily in a relationship with, but a, but a woman that I care about comes and says, oh, I'm, and they're crying and stuff, and they're sharing something with me. I listen to them. I hug them. Uh, uh, sometimes, I, depending on the situation, I'll cry with them. And then, I, then when they've calmed down a little bit, I'll say, do you want me just to listen or do you want me to fix it, try to fix it? And they'll say, I just want you to listen. Or they'll say, um, please comment. That, that's being aware of the other person's need and paying attention to them and letting them tell you what they need. And the same thing is true about someone mourning or going through grief uh, when they've lost someone. You can just listen to them. You can stand with them in their grief. As Brother Luke said, you can cry with them and just be with them. Don't try. You don't have to try to fix it. You don't have to say the perfect thing. You're not going to make them feel better. What makes a person feel better is when you come alongside them and you stand with them in their grief or stand with them in their rejoicing. Wow. That was very profound. I, uh, it made me think of a book I read long before I read the Bible. And uh, this was early uh, in my marriage. I went through very difficult times in my marriage. And uh, I was trying to figure out how to get along with my wife. <laughs> I read this book, Men Are From Mars, Women Are From Venus. And it's actually a very good book. But the premise, of course, is that men and women are actually different. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if, you know, it's not really politically correct now to say such a thing. Of course thing. not. Of course not. But, um, uh, that's uh, one of the points of the book is that we need to recognize that uh, 
for example, uh, let's say you, you've been working all day and you, uh, when you get home from work, your spouse, your wife, I'm talking from a man's perspective now, your wife is, uh, uh, well, wants to talk to you about something. And the statistics say that a man only says about maybe 6,000 words per day. Correct, if that. Yeah, and a, but a woman says like 17,000 words yeah. in a day. Yeah. So when the man gets home and uh, uh, he's already said, you know, 5,997 words and, he, and all he has left is what's for dinner? <laughs> yeah. That's he's, right. done. he's done and and but his wife has like you know fifteen thousand more words left to say that's exactly your right your wife needs to tell you things that are concerning her yeah and the man listens uh, and he uh immediately can figure out the solution to every problem she's she's expressing he that's can right. and instantly uh, analyze it and come up with the right solution yeah so the man wants to solve the problem, give him a, qu a quick answer to the problem. And Correct. then, okay, we're done. We're done. Don't tell me anymore. Here's the answer. Yeah. But what you said is, hey, do you want me to just listen? Or do you want, want me to try to give you an answer? Yeah. And uh, if, if, they, if they actually do want to get an answer and they're actually going to respond that way, that would be wonderful. Mm -hmm. but, yep. but they, normally they don't really want an answer. We want to give them an answer. And they're really not seeking an answer. They just need to vent and get it all out. Correct. They need someone to be a good listener. And that's why James comes into play and be quick to listen, slow mm -hmm. to speak, slow mm -hmm. to anger. Um, but so there were some truths in that book. So I think some valid points because men and women are different. Our brains work differently. Our, our hormones are different. Right now, my hormones are more feminine. Well, I don't. I don't I think got, that's true. I got, I got less male, male hormones than I used to. That's why I got the andropause. And, uh, oh, jeez, <laughs> part of aging, bro. Yeah, I can still grow a beard, though. That's good. You sure can. I, I think you got plenty of testosterone still in your, in your veins, there, buddy. Okay. Um, now, verse uh, sixteen: Be of the same mind one toward another. Mind not high things, but condescend to men of low estate. Be not wise in your own conceits. Oh, now, wow. this, is, this is KJV. I think I know what it means, but I have an idea that maybe the Amplify could be helpful in this case. Do you want me to read it or do you want to just respond to the first? This Go ahead and read it. I love it when you read both. That's great. You don't always have to, but I enjoy it. Yeah, here's the 16 in the Amplify. It says, live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty. That is, don't be conceited or self-important, exclusive. But associate with uh, humble people, those with a realistic self-view. Do not overestimate yourself. Hmm. I like that. Um, I would disagree. Well, I guess harmony could be construed as same mind. This reminds me uh, of other times that Paul has, uh, has extolled us to be of be of one mind. I guess that's a little bit different. Be of same mind, be of one mind. Um, but back then, uh, he wanted us all to believe the same thing. You know, there, there's there's one truth. Let's all be on the same page. Let's believe the same thing. And don't have all these uh, denominations and, um, gosh, how many denominations are there in the world? Different churches and uh, different beliefs and different people holding different things. And that's why there's so much confusion, in my opinion. Um, not in the actual body, but in the, in the, uh, the, the Christian world. Uh, because we're not of the same mind. This is why there's so much dissension and so much backbiting and fighting and, and betrayal and all the stuff that exists. Um, because we're not in the same mind. Now, the true body, the true remnant, the true believers do have the same mind, do are of one mind, uh, but that's a, a, a small percentage of people, um, and it, it's it's unfortunate. We should all have the same belief. We should all believe uh, uh, the same gospel, 
and uh, and and I think you agree on that. At least we should all have the same gospel, and and know what it is, and uh, uh, believe in that. Um, I like that it says, "Mind not the high things." Now, to me, that that means um, uh, things that are haughty, things that are uh, unnecessary in some ways. To even uh, it's okay to discuss it, but don't worry about it. Don't focus on those things. Um, I, I love the King James version a little bit better. The word condescend, condescend to men of low estate, people people that you consider to be below you, like your gardener or the the person that that delivers your newspaper or whatever, or the, the, the men that pick up your garbage. How about that? Um, I make it a point, and this, again, this isn't bragging. This is just what I've learned. I'm a polite guy. Um, I treat everyone the same. I try to, at least, you know, the people, the, my mail carrier, or uh, the, the person that picks up my garbage or, or the governor of the state. If I were to meet him, I would treat them all the same way. I would be kind to them. I would be uh, have the same personality that I have with anyone. I hold no person in this world in high regard. I hold God in high regard, and I hold uh, fellow believers uh, in 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 that uh, in the the same way, and then everybody else. Uh, but uh, I do condescend to treat all people in this way. Uh, but I, I suppose I could always do better. And then lastly, be not wise in your own conceits. Um, and I'm going to scroll down to what the, I mean, you just read it, but I'm looking at that verse. Uh, Live in harmony with one another. Don't be haughty, conceited, and self-important, exclusive, but associate with humble people. Those with realistic self-view, do not overestimate yourself. I like the way that it states it better here. Do not overestimate yourself. Um, he he's also uh, phrased it, brother Luke. Do not think too highly of yourself, which I agree with. Um, know that you were once a sinner. You were once a sinner. You were you were once oblivious to the things of God. You had no idea what it was until He came into your life and and made your spirit alive. Before that, you were a dead zombie. You didn't have any knowledge. You didn't have any of the fruits of the spirit. You had nothing. You were dead. Don't forget that. I mean, it's been a long time that I've been a believer, but I, but, um, I, I don't ever think too highly of myself. Uh, I, I've struggled with, with, um, uh, and I've mentioned this before, uh, the period of time in my early twenties when I thought I knew everything there was to know about the Bible and nobody could teach me anything. A lot of that was just being silly youth, uh, just n not having gone through any circumstances or tribulation yet at that point. And thinking that I had everything under control and, and no one could tell me anything. Uh, trust me, <laughs> I'm far away from that stance now. Uh, I, I don't consider myself better or over anybody else. Uh, whatever gifts God's given me, he's given me because he gives liberally uh, uh, to, to those that he loves. And so I consider the gifts that he's given me gifts. The, the, they don't make me better than anyone else. And I try to live that way. Yeah, I'll turn my fan off here. Um, the uh, oh, I don't need my pen really. I haven't had to take any notes yet tonight. But I, uh, the thing that uh, threw me on the verse in the KJV was the word condescend, and maybe it's because uh, um, I I take the word condescend as a pejorative. Uh, oh yeah, have uh, you? Uh, have you ever someone uh, had someone talk to you in a condescending manner? Yes. Offensive to you that made the you made they were giving you the feeling that they were above you. Yep. And they were just oh I'm, I'll come down to your level but I'm really above you. Mm -hmm. That's that's how I take condescending as a negative kind of a thing, but mm -hmm. in this case it's telling us we need to condescend, mm -hmm. but I don't want to have a condescending attitude. Right. And in the sense that we we're willing to associate people who are below us in, in some kind of a standing, you know, exactly. a profession or an income or an education or something that's greater than someone else's. Be willing to associate with people who are not reached this level in, in some way and, and, and they're on a lower level in some grading system and, and be willing to associate with them. Exactly. I love the way you said that. Because generally, it, 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 you do get the idea. If someone has a condescending attitude rather than 
condescending to your same level, those things are different. And people do that all the time. They make condescending remarks. Uh, yeah, I react to that as well, negatively. <laughs> uh, I've always liked the, the term, uh, be not wise in your own conceits. And I've thrown that around quite a bit over the years because I've had to deal with a lot of people that they, uh, the Bible also says, uh, do not think too highly of yourself. And that's what yeah. the Amplified translates this, be not wise in your own conceit is, don't think too highly of yourself. Don't think higher of yourself than you ought to. Be right, humble. right. Uh, but, uh, you know, I encounter a lot of people that uh, they're wise in their own conceit. Mm -hmm. yeah. They think much more of themselves than they ought to. They don't have any humility. They're no. unteachable. They're yeah. unwilling to even consider that they could possibly be wrong. Right. They think that they're infallible and omniscient. Yeah. Uh, I made a video a long time ago. Well, not a long time, probably a year ago, actually. Uh, some of our friends uh, caused me, so, uh, were, were, you were you talking about me? Or uh, I'm worried I need to ask you if you're, that's applying to me. Uh, and, uh, and you I, said yes? I, no. no <laughs> I said, it's, it, it's, you, you took it wrong. Um, yeah. maybe, or maybe they didn't actually watch the video. They just went by the title. The title right. is, uh, I'm seeking a new Bible teacher. Oh. Looking for, I'm looking for a new Bible teacher. Uh -huh. So some of the people who work with me, uh -huh. they when they thought that, and I thought they thought, oh, is he unhappy with uh, working with me? Is he yeah. trying to find another Bible teacher? Right. And the whole video was based on, look, I need a Bible teacher who uh, understands every single verse in the Bible perfectly. <laughs> and then there's only one person that could be, but I'm not going to take <laughs> your punch. Line. Yeah. And uh, the point the point is, there are some people we encounter that seem to think that they've got it all figured out. They couldn't possibly be wrong about anything. That's right. They're wise in their own conceit, I would say. Yeah, and guess what else? They're wrong yeah. about not being wrong. Yeah. Uh, verse 17, recompense to no man evil for evil. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. I'm, uh, I don't think we need to be talk about that verse very much but you want to say something about that i'm anxious to get on to the next one no get on to the next one i think it's it's pretty clear verse 18 is what i've been waiting for for like an hour um it says if it be possible as much as lieth in you live peaceably with all men there it is now i thought of this verse when in the early in our conversation today yeah. I remember when I was talking about how we are not required to be friends with everybody uh -huh. there. Even if we share the faith, uh -huh. even if doctrinally we're in agreement, right? These people have a, a personality that's abrasive and offensive. We are not required to be friends with everybody. Right. And Paul is telling us here, if it be possible, that tells me that, hey, it might not always be possible. Right. But it, it, when it is possible, mm -hmm. we can make peace with all men, be yeah. at peace. Yeah. So, yes, let's strive to have peace with everybody and get along and, and associate with everybody. Mm -hmm. Let's give everybody a chance for that. But you're going to count, encounter some people where it's just not possible to have peace with them. Right. And even though you, even though they're, they're brethren, yeah. you've got to dust off your feet and move on. And yeah. separate just because they're, uh, you know, I've had a few friends, even uh, I have a, a couple of non believer friends. My wife said to me many years ago, she was always upset that I was a friend with these people that no one would associate with them. Yeah. They were so obnoxious and abrasive and, uh, and uh, uh, that no one would have anything to do with them. But because I was kind to them, uh, I'm the only one that was, right. they latched onto me i'm their best friend for and my wife had to suffer uh with this obnoxious person because i you know i, I befriended them and, yeah but it's not fair to put even if i can tolerate a person like that That's and right. i don't tolerate that anymore right but even if i would tolerate that it's not fair to have your friends and family force them to tolerate some obnoxious person right true all right uh you have something to say about verse 18 no, I think you did a good job. Thank you. All right, then. Uh, let's go to 19. It says, Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath. 
for it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, saith the Lord. Yes. I'm going to read that in the Amplified. I'm curious. Do it, Do it up. 19 Amplified is, uh, beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave the way open for God's wrath and his judicial righteousness. For it is written in scripture, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. Yeah, not, nothing really revealing there. Uh, and that's not a, a principle that we're not all very familiar with. Let's not take revenge ourselves. Let, let, let the Lord deal with it. Yeah. Any more to be said on that? I'll just say two things really quickly. In the world, there's a phrase. One, one is, uh, I'm not going to get mad. I'm going to get even. And I've heard people say this. The attitude in the world is if if you know if the person the person did this, I'm gonna get them. I'm gonna let their other tires or I'm gonna do this or do that. They do take revenge into their own hands and uh, much to their own dismay many times. There's another phrase that um, if you're gonna go after someone with thoughts of revenge, dig two graves. Mm -hmm. hmm. Dig two graves. Dig a grave for the person that you're going to revenge and dig a grave for yourself because that, that's how bad it, it is. Um, so this, I, I agree with you that this is clear to, to everyone, uh, but I just wanted to say that it's very different with the way that the world views vengeance. I mean, it's, it's the theme for many uh, a movie, a Hollywood movie is vengeance. And we get off on it. I mean, people in general get off on going and watching some movie um, where uh, some some guy's family's killed, and the whole movie is him going back and getting everyone, getting even with everyone, and and mayhem and killing and murder left and right. So the world understands vengeance a different way; that they take it in their own hands. But this is Paul saying to us, "Vengeance is the Lord's to repay. Don't worry about it. If someone does something wrong to you, uh, don't worry about it because um, it's in God's hands. That's all." Yeah. Okay. Uh, now the next verse. It's always been one of my very favorite verses. And it's been a very, uh, I've had to really keep this in mind. And I find out that it really works. It works like magic. Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. For in so doing, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. Mm. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good amen now that's uh i'm going to read in the amplified in a minute but uh, i think there's a you don't need the amplified no. to understand this no. uh, your thoughts on that brother yeah so this is the same thing uh when uh other verses in scripture talk talk about um when did we do this when you know when we're talking to god and it says well, when, when he's talking to us, not to other people, not the people he says depart from me, but when he's talking to us, when did when did you, we clothe you when you were naked? When did we when you were thirsty? Did we give you drink? And he said, when you did this to the least of them, you did it unto me. So then we have Paul saying here, very very plain and simple. Listen, guys, and this is the modern day Paul. So forgive me for translating in this way because just just the way I want to do it. Uh, Paul is saying, look, guys. If your enemy's hungry, feed him. If your enemy's thirsty, give him some drink. For in doing so, you're putting him in into a situation where you're treating him with kindness and heaping uh, coals of fire on his head. Uh, I think it's a beautiful way to do it. And this works in real life. When someone's being mean to you, they cut you off in traffic. Or, or maybe you cut them off and they pull into traffic next to you and they roll their window down, they're flipping you off and, and saying flippity flip and flow and flip and flow. And uh, you just look at them and say, yeah, you know, whatever you're upset about, I'm sorry, I apologize, God bless. A lot of times that diffuses someone immediately when you treat them with kindness, even though they're yelling and, and uh, yelling obscenities at you. When you don't pay them back with the same, it, 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 totally takes their power away from them. And this is an example, uh, a real modern day example of what that is. They can't do anything about it. There's nothing they can do. And then 21, be not overcome with evil, but overcome evil with good. And that's, I just used an example of where that was. When people are being evil with us, treat them kindly, treat them, treat them well, uh, treat them with goodness. 
Um, when someone, you know, I've had so many bad roommate situations where when I'm telling someone else a story, they said, oh, I would go after the go after him and I would do this and do that. And I, I'll, I'll tell a quick story. I know we're about to wrap it up, but um, I, I, many of you know, I went through a divorce and um, it was, it was, it was my wife's fault. <laughs> I, I'm just kidding. I mean, there, it's two people in a relationship, but uh, she's the one that decided to leave. And when I was telling the story to uh, certain friends of mine, um, everything was in my name because my credit was better than hers. And I literally had all the bills in my name. And I actually had a friend and his dad that I was talking to about this. They said, you know what I'd do, Crips? I would turn the power off. I would shut off her cable, turn the power off, shut everything off in her name. And then she'd be sitting over there in the house in the dark. That's what I'd do. Of course, I never would have considered doing that because I left that, that marriage the same way I came into it with dignity and integrity and respect. I have no regrets from the way that I left that marriage. I helped her when when, when I left the house and um, the, our lease was up and she had to move and some of my stuff was still there. I went and packed up my stuff and got the, got the remnants of, of uh, the things that were mine out. Again, this isn't bragging. This is just what the Holy Spirit was leading me to do. And then she had a real hard time getting organized throughout the marriage. And, and certainly that hadn't changed because she decided she didn't want to be married to me anymore. So I stayed for several hours and helped her pack her things and helped her get them down to the get down to the truck. I didn't have to do that. In fact, my attitude should have been, you know what? You're done with me. I'm done with you. I'm, I'm out of here. Forget it. I'm not helping you with anything. You've treated me unkindly. You've betrayed me. You stabbed me in the back and uh, I'm not, I'm not doing it. But the, for, for some reason, the Holy Spirit was leading me to be kind to her and leave the divorce the same way I came into the marriage, which was do it kindly. And she's had nothing bad to say about me. It was amicable. Our divorce is amicable to this day. I mean, we don't talk a whole lot. It's text messages every once in a while, birthdays and Christmas. But she's had nothing to say bad about me. She can't say anything bad about me because of the way that I treated her. And so that's overcoming evil with good. Just a quick example. Okay. Uh, well, this is the last verses, and we'll finish for tonight. But I, I can tell you that um, I have used this, the teaching, the last two verses here. Uh, it served me very well for, for many years. And they're kind of um, related to Jesus' teaching about uh, love your enemy and turn the other cheek. Uh, it And we actually will be amazed when we actually employ these techniques to people. I've had, um, you know, in, in person, street preaching, I've done this, and even much more so online, where people will make a uh, very rude or hateful reaction to me right off the bat. And maybe they haven't even watched the whole video or anything, and, and they're, they're just re reacting to the opening remarks or the, the title of the video, and they're already, already all over me. Mm -hmm. But rather than being rude back to them, uh, I give them a kind answer, mm -hmm. and that they are, they are expecting an argument back. Yep. But because they didn't get an argue, the same kind of uh, um, attitude coming back at them, I can't tell you how many times I have, have the reaction has been from them. Yeah. I believe that this burning hot coals on their head refers to shame. Yeah, shame. Yeah, I agree. I believe that when someone mistreats you and you don't respond in kind, yep. but you instead show them a loving, forgiving attitude, and then they feel ashamed of themselves. And they've said that to me. They said, I'm ashamed of what I said to you. I'm sorry. I never should have talked to you that way. And uh, I'm embarrassed about it. And I'm, I'm really sorry. It mm -hmm. happened many times. Um, I agree. That's great. I'm glad you shared that. That's awesome. Okay. So that uh, that completes the, uh, the the chapter. And it's time to say goodnight because it's 11.09 Eastern time. Awesome. Uh, I guess uh, give me your, your summary on, on the talk tonight and then we'll uh, finish up. Sure. Lots of, lots of good verses here. I, I love that he's stating things to us. It's not suggestions. These are, these are uh, things that Paul is telling us that we should do. 
And they're, um, I, I, I love how it starts out. He's talking about the importance of love. And as I said at the beginning of the broadcast, um, that is throughout the whole Bible. The, listen, guys, the Bible is a love story. And the, the biggest thing that keeps getting, I, I, I've never looked to see how many times the word love is said in Scripture, but it's a lot. It's a lot. Do you have a video on how many times love is said in Scripture, Brother Luke? <laughs> no. No? Okay. No. Um, but it, it's a lot, guys. And the, the bottom line of all things is even of the gifts that are described, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, uh, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, uh, meekness and temperance i think that's correct uh love is the love is the best love is the most important one it also says that uh, we can have all knowledge we can have everything uh all the gifts that god offers and don't have charity and then we have nothing so it's important to love one another it's important even as paul states in um in these verses to love even our enemies. And he tells us why it's important and what happens when we do that. So um, just to, in, in parting and, and uh, wrapping things up, I would say that if you're concentrating on uh, keeping your eyes on Jesus, it's going to be easier for you to love others because you're, you're trying to uh, exemplify you're an ambassador, you're a Christian, you're an ambassador to Christ Jesus. And uh, it, it's easier to love people when you love him with everything, um, as Christ commands us to do. Mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, thank you, chat. You guys are awesome. I love you guys. Um, I appreciate all the um, uh, comments on my behalf for my birthday, even though uh, Brother Luke pointed out that uh, it wasn't actually my birthday. It was a celebration of the day that I was born. <laughs> but uh, I love you guys. I hope you guys have a good week, and uh, we'll uh, uh, see you again next Wednesday. Yeah. <laughs> I, I called it the anniversary of your birthday. That's right. Sorry, anniversary. You're correcting me twice now. Yes. Okay, let's not okay. make it happen. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, Brother Cripps, thank you for being with me tonight. Uh, of course, we miss Sister Renee. I think she was in the chat room uh, tonight. I hope she has a wonderful vacation with her son James and um, uh, brother uh, brother Michael uh, contacted me. I uh, apologize that he couldn't be with us tonight because he has uh, his girlfriend uh, wanted him to go to a concert with her, so they went to a concert tonight. But I expect him to be back with us next Wednesday. Awesome. And uh, so we'll begin uh, chapter thirteen next uh, next Wednesday. Uh, this was interesting uh, chapter because it really doesn't wasn't talking about salvation that I remember at all. It, it's no. all talking about okay, at, and this is not how to become a Christian. Right. I'm going to tell you how to be a Christian. That's how right. To be a Christian. Now that you are one. Now that you've become one. Yeah. So this was uh, really, uh, you could say it. It's instructions. It's advice. It's it's maybe directions. It's commands. It's telling us, hey, okay, now this is what we expect of you. Now that you are a believer. Amen. If you, well, do this, point. if you do these things and you follow his instructions here, you will be doing well, blessing others and having a blessed life yourself. Um, okay, I guess I don't think of anything else to, to say, except don't forget to uh, join us uh, Sunday, uh, 5 p.m. Eastern for our Sunday uh, program. Amen. Okay, thank you. Every oh, by the way, everybody in the chat room, I did um, here and there, I was looking at all the comments and a lot of really good comments in the chat room. Particularly, a lot of really good comments from Hendrix. I wish I should have responded. Um, someday, maybe Hendrix will join us in here on the paneling and actually engage here. He engages so much in the chat room. He has so many good thoughts that he he gives us in the chat room that uh, I'd like to just respond to all his comments. Uh, yeah, but yeah, uh, he thinks he's too young and doesn't have anything to offer. He's incorrect. Hmm. Okay. Incorrect. All right. So, uh, that room and all, to all the saints, uh, thank you for participating and bless you all in the name of our great Savior, God, Jesus. <laughs>